How many folks are coming from outside of the college completely? Like, oh, wow, excellent. Well, welcome to the California College of the Arts, founded in 1907 with a social mission to make change, social, economic, cultural change through the arts um, as part of the arts and crafts movement. I'm Christian Simsarian. I'm the chair of interaction design here at California College of the Arts. Uh, our program is pretty new. It was formed in 2011. And we have um, the mission to increase the capacity to shape technology, to humanize technology, through a new human-centered discipline. And I'd be happy to talk about that for a long time. Um, but what's really interesting about um, leading up to Zaid's uh, presence here is technology is playing an increasing role. And as in society and culture in our future, it's certainly part of one of the 21st century skills. And as we set out to design our new master's program, we were looking at how can we teach the technology shaping skills to designers, budding, um, budding design leaders, as well as give them the skills to navigate complex social problems. And the great thing about tools like design thinking and interaction design are that they're increasingly powerful and relevant and valuable in the world, and yet they lack uh, a compass or direction about where and how to proceed in facing uh, today's contemporary complex social challenges. And so one thing that's really exciting to have Zaid here, and he's been a great influence on the master's program. In fact, we've, um, we've just now, just this, over this next week, are founding a social lab. And um, we're hoping that this is going to help um, provide a structure and a framework for us to have that compass as we try and do the work that's not necessarily being done by industry, looking at things like information equity and te technological justice and whatever that means. Um, so with that, I am really happy to introduce uh, Zaid Hassan, who is um, has an incredible uh, amount of airline miles. He travels around the world, everywhere from Yemen to Mexico to New Zealand to back around probably every continent, excluding the poles, perhaps. And um, looking at complex situations around the world, he sees everything from um, starting to address uh, a challenge to situations that are on all-out warfare around resource challenges. And has worked uh, for the last 15 or so years with a group called uh, Rios Partners addressing um, uh, complex challenges around the world in, while experimenting with a variety of approaches. And just in the last few years, with the launch of uh, Zaid's book, Social Lab Revolution, he has uh, a new framework, which is a collection of the best practices of that in uh, a new model that he calls the Social Lab, which is what we're going to hear about tonight. So with that, Zaid is on. <laughs> everyone just shut up and we sat there and we listened to this person snore. So what I'd like to do is just make sure you're sitting next to someone within kicking reach. So if someone sort of snoring, you can give them a good kick. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about a question. Here's a question for the evening. And um, as <clears throat> Christian said, so my background is that um, I've been working with uh, community people around the world on trying to figure out how we respond effectively to challenges that are complex in nature. Uh, and 
before I kind of get into all of that, uh, I just wanted to address uh, one word on the screen here, which is the word practice. Right? So we're talking about design practice. What does it mean to talk about a practice? Uh, and there's been, there's been lots and lots of press over the last couple of years about design thinking and, and what design thinking is. And I was reading um, HBR had the cover story. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Anyone seen it? Cover story in HBR, right? About how design thinking is essentially coming of age. And I was reading um, the articles in there, and they referred to design thinking in several different ways. So it was a tool, it was a process, it was a practice. And it seemed quite confused to me. So before we kind of uh, dive into it, um, for me, the way I understand practice is very simple. Um, so the analogy I use is with cooking. So if you think about what cooking is, cooking is a practice, right? You have tools. So you have you know <clears throat> frying pans and knives and spatulas. Uh, and you have processes, frying and baking and sauteing. You have ingredients. Uh, and you have people doing the work. You put all this together, and hopefully you get something that you can eat, right? Uh, but that's a practice. And the thing about um, any practice, and cooking is a practice, is that you have to do it, right? There's no way of learning cooking by studying cooking for two years and then saying to your family, that, right, we're ready to cook now. <coughs> it's going to be really good, right? It just doesn't work. So you've got to do it in order to get good at it. And if you stop doing it, you get bad at it. Is that fair? Fair description of a practice? Yeah, it's the same with any, any practice. So, you know, if you think about football, if you think about um, sports, sports are similar. You've got to put these things together, um, techniques, tools. Uh, and, yeah, they come together in a practice. And that's how I think about uh, design. So design practices, you've got to put these things together. Yes, you have tools, you have pencils, and you have, you know, <coughs> laptops, and you have um, cameras and you have all sorts of things, right? Um, but ultimately, they have to come together in a practice. And what you get at the end, uh, the proof is whether someone wants to eat what you cook. Okay? So if it tastes bad, then it's not very good. That's it. Is that fair? Now, here's the thing. Um, uh, if you think about cooking as a practice, it's a fairly mature practice. We've been doing it for a while, right? Like, it's not new. We didn't discover it last week. Um, but um, if you think about cooking today, it's become much more complex and fraught, if you like, as an activity than it has been any time in the last 100 years. So now when you cook, you've got to think about whether your chicken is fair trade and whether it was raised in a factory farm. Um, you've got to think about health. You've got to think about sugar. You've got to think about um, supply chains. You've got to think about all of these things, right? And you've got to think about your practice as bringing those things together in terms of making decisions. So when you cook, you're making decisions about what you're eating, what you're putting on the plate, what you're feeding people. And those decisions are fraught with uh, risk, if you like, right? They become ethical and moral choices. Yeah? So in some ways, what's happened is complexity has invaded cooking, just as it has invaded design. So your choices are now essentially laden with um, consequences. Yeah? So you've got to make decisions about the type of paint you use. Is there lead in your paint? Is there not lead in your paint? Right? Um, the clothes you wear for all of these are decisions. Make sense? Yeah? So I'm going to talk about complexity <coughs> to start off with. And um, <coughs> so I'm basically going to talk in threes, uh, which Christian has heard me do several times. So I usually draw triangles. He was intensely concerned that I didn't have any visuals for you. So I'm not going to use any visuals. I'm going to talk. Um, and if something doesn't make sense, put your hand up and interrupt me and say, what are you talking about? That doesn't make sense. So yeah, so feel free to interrupt me. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of breaks. So um, I'm going to ask you to talk to each other at some point, and then we're going to do a Q&A. So my hope is that we can get to the Q&A quickly, and we can just have a conversation rather than you listen to me for the next two hours. Is that fair? Yeah? Not supposed to be next door in the Pilates class? <laughs> OK. Good. Um, OK, so the news is that the world is getting more complex. We've all heard that, right? Unless you've been living on the moon, you know that this is true. You've been hearing this, right? You've been hearing it in the media, and you've been hearing the word complex used more and more and more to describe the kinds of situations that we all are involved in. So whether that's public health care or politics or um, climate change or poverty, the word complex is deployed more and more to describe the situations that we find ourselves in. So what does it mean for something to be complex? What does it mean when, what do we mean when we use the word complex? So, Here's one, <clears throat> here's one explanation of the word complex. So things that are complex or situations that are complex have three characteristics. Okay, so the first characteristic is that they are <coughs> emergent in nature. They I'm sorry, I can't wait. They're emergent in nature, right? So what does that mean? <coughs> so if I take this pen. Yeah. Sorry, I don't Can you hear me? Hear you. Do you want to come forward a little bit? Come forward a bit. 
It's okay, come forward. So <clears throat> I'll try and talk louder, yeah? So if you can't hear me, just come forward. There are loads of seats in the front. Um, <clears throat> so the first characteristic is the situations that are complex are emergent in nature, okay? And uh, the opposite of emergent is predictable, okay? So if I take this pen and I throw it across the room, the path this pen follows is predictable. You can write the equations down to the path. You know where this pen is going to go. I'm going to throw it to Jeff, right? So he caught the pen because he knows where it's going, right? That's a predictable path. <laughs> the light was in my eyes. <laughs> More unpredictable. So if I took a pigeon, a live pigeon, and I threw this pigeon across the room, the path that the pigeon takes is unpredictable, right? It's emergent. We don't know where this pigeon is going to land, right? We don't know whether it's going to go away from the light, whether it's going to try and find a door. But the, the situations that we deal with that are complex in nature are emergent, a bit like a pigeon, right? So we don't know where they're going. They're not like throwing a pen across the room. But what we've been trained for is throwing a pen across the room, right? Predictable linear paths, right? So that's one characteristic. And then the second characteristic is that because these situations are emergent, we like tracking them. So what we like to do is we like to put a GPS on the pigeon and we like to download the data onto our laptops, right? We want to track the pigeon. So what, we, what complex situations do is we generate huge amounts of information about complex situations because we're trying to deal with, we're trying to get to grips with where this situation is going and information seems to be a key way of doing that, okay? Now the problem with that is that we generate so much information that we don't really know what to make of it. Yeah, so there was a, a report published uh, last year by the World Bank and they looked at um, how many of the reports that they published were read. And what they found was that two-thirds of every, all reports that they published were never read by anybody, okay? Except the author and their mom, obviously, right? So, um, <clears throat> and, and so what that points to, and what, what this, uh, this Washington Post article was basically saying is, what if the solutions to our challenges were in those two-thirds of reports that were never read, right? So obviously people are doing useful work in thinking about these challenges. They're writing them up, they're putting them out there. But there's so much out there that we don't have the capacity to process. We don't have the capacity to absorb them. And you know, I'm sure all of you have had this experience where you know, you're working on a particular issue and you tell someone you're working on it. So you say I'm working on this issue <clears throat> you know, around um, economic justice or whatever it is, right? And someone says to you, well, have you read the latest report on that issue by Doug? And you kind of go, no, I haven't read the report. <clears throat> but I will, I promise I will. I'll read the report, right? And that happens all the time. And, and so, <laughs> right? You've had that experience, right? And the challenge is that the amount of information in the world is doubling every two years, okay? So it doesn't matter what you work on, there will be stuff about the situation you're dealing with that you have not read, not absorbed, do not understand, right? And cannot, and you will not. It's just not possible to do it. So um, that's another characteristic of a complex situation. You cannot know the sum totality of what is happening in a complex system. It is literally impossible, okay? That's the second characteristic. Does that make Make sense? Yeah, with me? Still awake? Um, okay. Then, it, yeah. When you, <clears throat> when you cross in front of the thing, you turn green. <laughs> I do. Okay. Well, is that over bad? There, over there is better. Okay, over here is better. Yeah. Do you want to come forward? Yeah. Come forward. Well, so I, think, I think some books also, like, you know, if English isn't your first language, it's a little yeah. bit. You want me to use a mic? I think that would be much better. Is there a roving mic I can use rather than a fixed mic? I'd be like a politician if I stand behind the phone. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay, good. Um, okay, so the second characteristic is that we adapt to complex situations. We change our behavior, right, in response to what we hear and what we see around us. So I walked into a store here uh, yesterday and I picked up a carton of juice. And this guy was standing next to me, and he said, oh, you don't want to buy that, man. And I said, and I stopped, and I said, why? And he said, GMOs, don't want to buy that. And now I'm standing there kind of going, do I buy this? Do I not buy this? What do I do, right? And so <clears throat> I changed my behavior in response to information that is coming at me, and that information is coming all the time. And um, our situations are changing all the time. So the context that we're in are emergent, right? And then we have information about those uh, contexts, like GMOs in your juice. So you change your behavior. And you change your behavior uh, autonomously and spontaneously. You don't tell everyone that you're going to change your behavior. You don't broadcast this, right? You don't write a report about it. You just change. Yeah? 
Does anyone have a debate um, in their house about whether uh, it's butter or margarine? So we have this constant debate in our house, right? It's like, is butter good for you or bad for you? Should you eat butter? Oh, there's a new report out that shows that butter is good for you or it's bad for you or margarine is good for you or bad for you, right? So you're changing your behavior in response to new information that's always coming out, right? So that's complexity. And those three characteristics coming together mean that situations that are complex are changing in nature all the time. And we're trying to come up with responses and solutions to these situations. So it's a little bit like you know, the, the, the contrast I was making is that if you want to put um, a man on the moon or if you want to put a rocket up into space, the parameters of that problem are basically stable. So gravity doesn't change while you're trying to build a rocket. It stays the same, right? It's stable. Um, but if you think of a complex problem, the variables are changing all the time. Yeah? So if you think about, um, think about mental health and you think about, okay, what constitutes a mental health problem today? It's very different than 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago, right? So what constituted a mental health problem 50 years ago is not what a mental health problem is today. So the very nature of the challenge, if you like, is, is changing as we're trying to respond to it, which makes it very difficult. <coughs> yeah? So, so complex challenges, as I keep reminding myself, are difficult. Right? So you wake up in the morning and you say, why is this so difficult? Oh, it's because it's complex. Yeah? Um, does that make sense? OK, so what I'd like to do is just take um, five minutes with the person next to you and see whether that correlates with what they think and um, what questions are coming up for you. Just take five minutes with the person sitting next to you. And then I'll interrupt you. OK, so, um, so we're grappling with this kind of world of complexity, if you like, right? How do we respond to it? What do the best responses look like? Um, how do we simplify and so on? So that's the news. Is that going to work? Yeah. yeah? Cool. OK, so that's the news, right? That's, that's um, nothing new in a certain sense. Um, uh, so here's the bad news, right? The bad news is that there's a dominant response to complex challenges. So it's not as if we're all sitting around and the world is sitting around looking at all these, these challenges like climate change and poverty and justice and doing nothing about them. So we're doing huge amounts about them. We're spending vast amounts of money, vast amounts of talent, hundreds of hours of talent are going into trying to figure out how to address these challenges. So there's a dominant response, right? Where 99.9% .9 of our resources, money, time, energy goes. Um, so the bad news is the dominant response doesn't work. Right? That's the bad news. Um, and the reason it doesn't work is, uh, and, and so there's a name for the dominant response, and the name for that dominant response is strategic planning. Okay. So when you have a complex challenge, what do you do? You come up with a strategic plan to respond to the challenge. That's what you do. So if you wa walk into you know, your job one morning, and, and uh, your job is to come up with a response, and you say, OK, so we're going to come up with a strategic plan to deal with you know, injustice or this or that. No one is going to look at you like you have two heads, right? They're going to go, OK, yeah, that's what we're going to do, right? Whereas if you walk into your office and say something completely different, like, you know, we're going to test a solution out on a bunch of people, they might look at you like you have two heads. But we're going to come to that. So the dominant response is strategic planning. And, and historically, strategic plans take the form of five-year plans. Come up with a five-year plan, and <clears throat> someone designs the plan, you implement the plan, and then you evaluate the plan, right? D-I-E. Okay? <laughs> Doesn't work. Okay. Um, and, and, and strategic planning, in a sense, is, is, uh, is neo Soviet. It's like, you know, Moscow decides what the problem is, specs it out, right? Uh, writes a plan, and then the plan gets implemented, and the diktats flow from Moscow down to the provinces, and people do what they're told to do, right? And in theory, things get better. OK, so that doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is there's three characteristics of strategic planning that mean that it doesn't work. The first is that it's predictive in nature. So when you write a five-year plan, you're talking about the future, right? You're saying, OK, here's what's going to happen in year one, here's what's going to happen in year two, and then year three and year four. So it's predictive in nature, whereas the nature of the challenges you're dealing with are inherently unpredictable. They're emergent, OK? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to predict the future. It doesn't work, OK? You don't know what's going to happen in year two. and. Um, um, and they're formalized. You've got to be able to write it down. So what does it mean to formalize a strategic plan? It's got to go into a Microsoft product. 
okay? If it doesn't go into Microsoft product, it cannot be part of a strategic plan. Yeah? So it's got to go into PowerPoint, it's got to go into a Word file, it's got to go into an Excel spreadsheet. Otherwise, it cannot be part of a strategic plan. So it has to be formalized. You have to be able to say what it is, right? You have to put it into symbols and words. Does that make sense? Everyone recognize that one? Okay. And then the third characteristic is that people who come up with the plans have to be detached, okay? You have to be detached from the issue you're dealing with. So if you are um, the head of a UN agency, you cannot be the head of the UN agency in the country that you're from, right? So if you're from Afghanistan, you cannot be the head of a UN agency in Afghanistan because it's considered to be a conflict of interest. You will not be sufficiently detached from the situation on the ground to make decisions that are considered to be free of conflicts of interest. And as a consequence, planners have no skin in the game. Okay, so the failure of a plan doesn't mean that the planner suffers. Well, unless you're in the Soviet Union. That's different, right? So, so no skin in the game, basically. Skin in the game is considered to be a conflict of interest, right? And those are the three characteristics of strategic planning that make them completely unsuited uh, to complex situations, yeah? Predictive, formal, and detached. Does everyone recognize that? Yeah? And the bulk of our time, energy, and money goes into strategic planning. That's what we pay for. That's what we try and implement. Um, so one of my favorite questions when I'm working within organizations is to ask them what percentage of strategic plans in their organization fail. So let's and put it in even more simple terms. You try out 10 things, how many of those work, and how many of those fail? And I'm talking about, when, when I say failure, I mean very simple metrics, right? Is it on time, is it on budget, and is it on scope? That's it, right? So what percentage fail or succeed? Any guesses in a typical organization? Zero fail? Zero, all fail, okay. 95%, yeah, anyone else? So you're saying 100%, 95%, 70%, 50%? Anyone else? So I've been in organizations, the same organization, right? Say, so, okay, what percentage of what you're doing fails? And someone says, 0%. It's like, what do you mean? They say, everything we do works. It's like, okay. And then someone else says, that's rubbish. Everything we do fails. It's 100%. And then you're kind of like, wait a minute. So is it 0 or is it 100? And then someone says, well, it's 70%. And there's this argument, right? It's like, what percentage fails? Now, here's the thing. Um, the, there's very little literature on this. There's very little um, systematic analysis done of failure at project level um, in terms of uh, you know, time, budget, uh, and scope. But what the literature does say is that it's probably 90%, okay? Which begs the question, if we're looking at 90% failure of strategic plans, why are we putting all of our resources, time, energy, money into them? <laughs> exactly. So 10% of them, in theory, don't fail, um, unless we start looking at failure at another level, right? Which is, okay, let's forget about project failure, but let's talk about whether our organizations are actually succeeding in their goals and missions. So I had this conversation with a guy who is um, the head of a, a very well-known conservation organization. So their job is conservation, biological conservation of species, right? So I said, how are you guys doing? He said, oh, we're doing great. You know, fundraising funds are up. Like, we're making more money. We've, we're expanding our programs. Everything's great. And I said, well, uh, so how are we doing in terms of species loss? Oh, that's terrible. Species loss, right? So we're losing hundreds of species a year, but it's accelerating, and we're going to be losing thousands of species a year in the next couple of years. And essentially, we're looking at extinction. We're looking at an extinction event, right? So it's terrible. And it's like, but your organization seems to be doing really well. It's like, yeah, because people are worried about extinction, so they're giving us more money. But are we, are we, are we succeeding in our mission as an organization? No, basically. And I said to him, oh, you've been doing this for 50 years, and what you basically have to show for it is that extinction of species is accelerating. So I would argue you failed. And he laughed. He said, ah, oh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so what's happening at the systems level? So, you know, are we failing or succeeding at a systems level? Well, we, beyond a doubt, we're failing at a systems level if you talk about species loss, right? So if you start moving from a project level where people are talking about 90% failure, then you can come to situations where you're talking about 100% failure, which is you're guaranteed that what you're doing, mathematically certain, is going to fail. In which case, why are you doing it? So here's one answer as to why you're doing it. And I scratched my head about this for a long time. So one reason we do it is because it's muscle memory. 
it's what we do. It's what we're trained to do. We're trained to come up with a strategic plan, put it in front of our bosses who will sign it off. It's what we do, right? It's muscle memory. It's what we're trained to do, okay? And not doing that is very, very difficult, right? So, you know, when soldiers go into boot camp, um, they're untrained, right? They're broken down, right? Their muscles are retrained. So no one voluntarily, very few people, some people do, no one voluntarily wants to go through that process of breaking down their own training and learning a new set of skills, a new set of muscles, right? So complexity requires that we build a new set of muscles. That's the challenge. And the new set of muscles are muscles that we are not used to exercising. We're not familiar with the muscles required to deal with complex challenges. So that's the bad news. 90% of what's going on is <clears throat> essentially failing. We're seeing failure at a systems level. If we keep doing it, we're screwed, basically. So the challenge in front of us is to change our practice from one that is suited to a world that it, essentially we don't recognize the complexity of, as Christian said, to one where we recognize complexity and we tr start trying to figure out what the muscles are, if you like, what skills, capacities, um, uh, insights we need in order to act in that space. So that's the challenge, that's, and, and that's the bad news. So the good news is that um, we're very, very familiar in some ways uh, with dealing with complexity, okay? So if you think about um, <clears throat> what a lab is, right? So the proposition that I put forward in my book is that um, we have scientific labs for solving scientific problems, and we need social labs to solve social problems. Now, if you think about a scientific problem, take a medical problem, right? So if you think about, um, let's say you think about AIDS, okay? And you think, okay, uh, someone runs a research lab for AIDS, okay? So they're trying to figure out a response or a solution or a vaccine or whatever you want to call it for AIDS. Now, what we do not do is go to those people and say, okay, so you've been doing this for five years. How many people have you cured of AIDS? And if it's none, then you failed, right? You haven't cured anyone of AIDS, so what have you been doing for five years? And by the way, we want to know quarterly how many people are you going to cure of AIDS? We need quarterly metrics from you, right? Which is what we do in the nonprofit world, right? So you're going to have a log frame, you're going to have quarterly responses, and you know, if you haven't solved poverty or lifted this many people out of poverty or done this, then you've basically failed. Now, we don't do that in the sciences, right? We, don't, we think of research as an open-ended endeavor. We don't know whether we're going to come up with a solution or a response to the AIDS crisis, but as long as we're making forward progress and we can document that forward progress, we will keep investing and taking the risk. We don't do that with social problems. What we do is we fund a five-year plan, and we try and basically demonstrate that we've cured, solved, whatever it is, the problem within the context of a five-year plan. It actually makes no sense. Yeah, it's, it's like saying to someone who's doing cancer research that you haven't cured cancer in five years, therefore I'm cutting your funding. It's, it's just stupid. You would not do that, right? So the good news is that we're used to, in society, funding and supporting open-ended endeavors that are highly uncertain, that deal with situations that are highly complex. It's just that we don't do it in the social spheres. Yeah? Um, and the proposition on the table is that we can do it in the social spheres. Um, there are a set of characteristics, if you like, that a response um, that is effective for a challenge that's complex in the social sphere requires. And I'll just run through it really quickly, and then uh, we'll have a chat, and I'll take questions, yeah? So the three characteristics are this, right? So first is the response has to be social in nature. What does that mean? So the people that are impacted by the challenge that you're dealing with have to be involved in responding to it. Okay? And I'm not talking about consultation. Right? So I'm talking about actually involved in designing and collaborating and co-creating a response. They have to be involved in the response. They have to be involved. And that is very, very, very difficult to do. So if you think about... Um, <clears throat> Think about a problem you have in San Francisco. Does someone want to suggest one problem? San Francisco, complex challenge? Okay, homelessness, right? So homelessness is a good one, right? So it's like, okay, so we can come up with solutions to homelessness and we can impose them on homeless people, right? And typically, they don't work because homeless people get up and leave because they don't want to be in the institution that you've created, the flop house or whatever it is that you've created, right? So. Um, the challenge then becomes, well, how the hell do you involve homeless people in designing or co-designing a response to homelessness? How do you do that? It's very hard to do, right? Because homeless people <clears throat> don't come in and do brainstorms with you, right? With post-it notes, <laughs> right? That's not the world that they live in. So there's this challenge. And typically when we think about um, 
teams that are diverse in nature, we think about multidisciplinary teams. We think about teams that are basically what I would call characterized by horizontal diversity. So other white collar professionals who basically are comfortable with post-it notes. Okay, so you may be an anthropologist or an economist, but bottom line is, you know, you know what a post-it note is, and you can write on a you can write on a flip chart, and you know what a marker pen is, right? You know what a sharpie is, basically, right? Right. So that's the kind of diversity that we typically build into our teams, and we congratulate ourselves and say, "Wow, we've got a really diverse team. We all know how to use post-it notes, and we all talk different languages, and it's great." <clears throat> but that's not good enough. So what we're looking for is vertical diversity. Yeah. So people who don't know what a post-it note is don't know how to write with a Sharpie, right? <clears throat> and have a whole host of different requirements, if you like, to white collar professionals. That's very hard to do. So that's the first characteristic. Then um, the second characteristic is that the, the response has to be experimental in nature. And that's, that's just to put it in really simple terms, you have to try stuff out and see what happens, right? And with a five year plan, you're locked in. So. We did um, a big piece of work in India on child malnutrition, <clears throat> and one of the things we noticed was that there were no programs in India for urban malnutrition run by the government, okay? Not one program, even though 50% of the population was urban. And so we asked, we asked people, we said, oh, how come there aren't any programs for urban malnutrition in India? I mean, it's like 50% of your population is urban. And I was talking to this woman from UNICEF, and I asked her, <clears throat> and she sort of went, <clears throat> you know, and wouldn't answer the question. I said, what do you... No, really, I really want to know. She says, oh, I don't want to talk about it. It's like, come on, no, tell me. So she said, oh, well, there was this World Bank program that ran. It had a budget of $250 million, and it was to address urban malnutrition, and it failed. And now no one wants to address urban malnutrition. I was like, $250 million? She said, yeah. So, so when did you know it was going to fail? Oh, we knew halfway through it was going to fail. So what did you do? She said, well, we were locked in, so we had to spend the money. It's like, you spent $250 million on something you knew wasn't going to work. She was like, yeah, we had to. It was a loan, right? We had to spend the money. We borrowed the money. And it was just like, and now no one wants to touch this issue because we were locked into this five-year plan, right? So the very simple characteristic is try it out before you spend $250 million. Seems obvious, but it's not. <laughs> okay, so that's the second characteristic. And then the third characteristic, which is a little bit harder, is that the response has to be systemic in nature. Now, what does that mean? Um, so I'll, I'll put it in really simple terms. If you think about a challenge, you can divide the challenge into causes and symptoms. Think about symptoms, right? If someone is hungry, you can feed them, and you can provide shelter for someone who's homeless. But what are the causes that are driving people to be hungry, and what are the reasons for homelessness, right? So if you're trying to respond to a complex challenge, then you have to try and address the causal drivers of that situation. And that's an aspiration. It's not that you know how to do it and you can tick the box and say, oh, we did it, right? It's an aspiration. You've got to inquire into what's causing the situation and try and get to the root causes, right? So the three characteristics are that it's got to be social, it's got to be experimental, and it's got to be systemic in nature. And if you can try and bake those characteristics into a response, then the probability that you'll impact the situation goes up. And those are very, very difficult things to build into an intervention as compared to a planning-based response, right? Where it's like, well, I did a PowerPoint and I did an Excel spreadsheet, right? Easy, yeah? And also, we didn't have to, we consulted a lot of homeless people, but, you know, that was it, right? So we came up with a formal plan, five-year plan, we're going to invest $100 million in this issue, right? Which happens all the time, by the way, right? It happens, you know, there are foundations that basically will, will invest $100 million based on a five-year plan. Yeah, and that's the world we live in. So what's the challenge for us as designers then, right? So one of the central challenges, I think, um, that come up for me anyway when thinking about design practice is that if responses to complex challenges have to be social in nature, then um, who creates the design artifact? Who creates the proposal, the plan, the uh, strategy, um, whatever it is, the solution? Who creates it, right? It cannot be created by a designer. Right? It has to be social, it has to be collaborative in terms of co-creation, in which case, what's the role of the designer? What do you do as a designer? Right? If it's collaborative, inherently collaborative, you've got to get you know, 100 people to collaborate on co-creating a solution or co-creating a response or a strategy. What is it that you do as a designer? What is your role in that context? Right. 
So I'm going to leave you with that thought. But why don't we hear from people? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> well, it's so, I mean, again, like, it, it would be very easy for me to tell you what the answer is, but I don't know what the answer is, right? I mean, so one answer is facilitator, that you have to facilitate a co-creative response, but that's just one role. And also, you know, if you do bring social diversity into the room, there is a whole bunch of skills that are just missing, right? Right? You, you know, so if you recruit people into a team for representation, then you lack capacity, right? So it's like, okay, you know, you're in a room because you're a female. Thank you very much, right? That doesn't really work. It's like you're in a room because you have certain capacities that you bring to the table, and that's why you're here. That's a different story. So the challenge becomes a challenge of representation versus capacity. And then what do you do as a designer? What is your role in the room? What capacity do you bring into the room? What are you representing in the room? And what do you do with that tension? Questions, thoughts? Where does this leave you? No, that's just the question I'm leaving you with. That's not my question. And, you know, I mean, just to go back to the slide, I mean, the question is really, um, what is design practice, what is, what is, how is design practice going to evolve in a complex world, right? Right? That's the kind of question that we're thinking about. And what I've basically done is given you some context for that question. Um, yeah? Other thoughts? Slurs are always good. What's coming up for people? Maybe take, how are we doing on time? What are we thinking? We've got time, right? Why don't, we, why don't we take another five minutes in your small group? So talk to the person next to you or the other side if you've gotten bored with the person sitting next to you. Just take five minutes and then they will come back, yeah? Okay, can I get you back? Okay, what's coming up? Jeff's going to give you a mic to speak with. Um, what's coming up for people? What are you all talking about? Raise your hand and I'll... Does this work? Hello? Run the mic to you. And actually, when you start, can you just say your name and a little bit about what you do? Just a tiny bit, not, a, not an essay. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Ajay Bam, and I'm professor at Berkeley at Cal at the business school. I teach innovation entrepreneurship, and I'm also an entrepreneur. And uh, one of the discussions I was having was, what if the stakeholders don't want to participate in the... Uh, uh, in the process of design. So what do you do about it? Do you create incentives? You just to pay them. <laughs> $120,000 a year usually does it. <laughs> not, not sure, not sure. I don't think money, al money al <laughs> <laughs> not sure if money addresses the problem. And um, so essentially the question was, do you set yourself up for failure if the stakeholders don't want to participate and how do you go about it? So we were just debating that, so thanks. Yeah, any related questions to that? Yeah, one back there. Is a stakeholder someone who's... So the... works. Um, my name's Graham, uh, interaction designer and uh, teacher here at CCA. Um, so a friend of mine in uh, London works with the homeless and she um, works with the homeless in order to enable them to design policy with government to create better policies for the homeless, right? And um, I know she uses a, a bunch of processes including um, uh, uh, theatre, uh, techniques that Augusto Boal has developed. Um, and she, she came to San Francisco and she met with uh, homeless organizations here when she was sort of on vacation visiting me. And one thing she picked up was that 
Politically, there isn't the will to get people out of homelessness into regular lives in San Francisco. There is the will to sort of maintain them at a certain level. And so I feel like the, the one thing that defines what you can do as a designer is the will that's behind the money that is paying you to do your job as a designer, right? It's almost like it's already tainted with a certain color that enables certain possibilities and not others. Yeah, let's keep it going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That would be my su humble suggestion. At least. <laughs> That's good. Well, <laughs> let me just let me just take both of those very quickly, and then um, let's let's keep talking. Um, so, um, so th this issue of well, do stakeholders want it or not want it is one issue. Um, then the other issue is well, does the money want it or not want it, right? Um, and what do we do about those situations? So, w one thing I would say is that. Um, the issue of stakeholder participation is basically an issue of power, right? It's like, you know, what are the power dynamics? What are you inviting people into? And why will they participate, right? What is their incentive? What is their reason to participate? Um, and, you know, we, when we did this work in India, one of the things that we heard most frequently was people saying, well, have you got any malnourished, any mums of malnourished kids in the room? It's like, N no, we don't because their kids are malnourished and they've got things to do, right? Um, but it was like, well, we, we need the representation in the room from mums who are malnourished, whose kids are malnourished. So what was really interesting is there was this issue of voice, basically, right? So how do you get participation? How do you get the insight of a mum who has to look after a child that is malnourished into the room? And that was kind of the conversation that was going on. And you know, how do we do that and what do we do and how do we invite people in and so on? Um, and one simple solution to that was that, well, you don't, you go to them, right? You go to, you go to where they are and you participate in their lives and you deal with it, right? Which is obviously what people do when they do ethnography. But what was so interesting about that was that we went and took the team. So we had about 35 people who were part of this team. You know, roughly a third of them were from government, a third of them were for civil society, and a third of them were for the private sector. So we went and lived in villages for about a week where people were malnourished. The people from government said, I don't want to go. <clears throat> I've been to thousands of villages. What is it that I'm going to learn by going to another village? And this is a waste of my time. I don't want to do it. Um, and we said, well, have you ever lived in a village? And I said, no, but I've been to that. You know, these are, these are Indians who are participating in the process. They're like, I've been to thousands of villages. So they, ha and, and one of the reasons they didn't want to go was because it was hard. It was like hot and dirty and there was no water and there was no food and you know and so they had to eat what people ate and they had to live in their houses and they had to deal with whatever they had to de deal with anyway so once they got over the shock so and you know and other people had different responses right so there was a guy from a pharmaceutical company who wanted us to drive him to get breakfast every morning 2 hours each way i was like that's not going to happen and he's like yeah but the jeep is right here you can send the jeep off and it will get a meal for me and it'll come back <laughs> what's the problem we're not going to do that. So, so one solution to the participation issue is that you go to people, obviously, and you do your ethnography and so on, which we're used to doing. But the other thing that happened is that we actually had people as part of the team um, who worked in villages and communities, so community-based organizations, right? And these were mostly women. Um, and for the bulk of um, the process that we started, at least the couple, first couple of weeks, they didn't say anything. So they sat together in a group, and they said nothing, OK? And any attempt to get them to say something just didn't work, right? So they, would, they just didn't want to participate. And, and we were kind of in a, in a, in a workshop-type scenario, right? So we're in a workshop-type scenario. These people are frontline workers working in, in very impoverished communities. And we put them into a workshop context, and we expect them to participate. And they don't want it. And obviously, all the men were talking, right? So lots of very loud men talking suggesting things and so on. So that was the dynamic. When we went to the village and we went to the community, the dynamic completely flipped. Completely, right? So the men didn't know how to feed themselves. They didn't know where to get water. They didn't know where to sleep. They didn't know anything. And the people who basically sorted everything out were these women. And, and they suddenly came into their own, and they were suddenly like, ah, oh, we know what to do, right? And the power dynamics flipped almost completely in that context. And the power dynamics flip because power is also spatial, right? So what are we inviting people into? 
uh, what agency do they have in that space? What kind of power do they have in that space? And then we take people out of our comfort zones and we put them in a village where they're very disempowered. It doesn't matter if you're a deputy permanent secretary. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO of a pharmaceutical company. You cannot feed yourself because you're now dependent on these women to sort it out for you. So I would say that, and also what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that it isn't necessary to get every single stakeholder in the, in the system to be part of your process. What you've got to do is you've got to get their insights into your response, and you've got to figure out how to genuinely do that beyond consultation. And it's, it's so I would say it's a problem of how to constitute a team. Okay, So it's not like we need representation from everyone in the system, every homeless person. It's like how do you constitute a team where you have that vertical diversity in, and how do you then design your processes in the space that you're in to be amenable to very different power uh, relationships. I don't know if that helps at all. So that's one thing I'd say. Then the other thing about the money thing I would say is like, you know, that's a, kind of a little bit like saying, well, you know, the market doesn't want a response to this, so the market isn't going to pay for it, right? So the market doesn't want a response to climate change, so the market's not going to pay for a response to climate change, so we're all doomed, right? Obviously, that's not what's happening. So the market might not be responsive, but then what you do is you get together and you create pressure for the market to respond, right? You put pressure on the people that have capital and resources to respond. Now, if I were to ask people in this room and say, okay, how many of you would like to see a solution to the problem of homelessness in the Bay Area? Hands up, please. And, you know, is that real? Yeah, I would say it's real, right? I don't know any of you, but my guess is, yeah, you want to see a solution to that problem. And if that means you get together and you fight for it and you convince someone with a lot of cash to put money into it, that's what you do, right? And you use your skills as a designer, as a communicator to make the case that, you know, you better do this, right? And, you know, it's, in my mind, it's no more complicated than that. That might take 10 years to do or five years to do, but it's not sufficient to say that the market does not want a response to this problem or, you know, <clears throat> Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want a response or it doesn't really matter, right? You figure it out. Other thoughts, questions? What else is coming up? Hi, um, I'm Sam. I'm a year zero industrial designer here in the three-year program. Um, and just in, in response to your question about, you know, what role does a designer play, um, I think, you know, obviously, maybe not obviously, it's the same as the role of any other member of your team. It just brings a different process and a different way of thinking to the solution. Um, and then that got me thinking too, well, you know, maybe the more ways of thinking about a the problem and the more process you, processes you have for solving that problem, um, the better and more creative and more um, effective solution you might get. But at the same time, you know, if you go overboard and have like this giant team, I think things could kind of fall apart. So I guess my question that I pose to you and anyone else in the in the room is like, when do you know to stop? When do you know to say like, yep, that's my team right there. I have enough people. I have the mindset. Like, you don't want it too small, but you don't want it too big. Um, so I'm, yeah, that's just kind of a question I was posing, something I was wondering about. Yeah, and so one of the, um, one of the other ways of just framing the same question you're asking is that if you were to constitute a team, right, from scratch, you say, okay, resource is no barrier. We can have anyone we want on our team. Who would you get? Like, what does, the, what does a team that is good at dealing with complexity actually look like? And I would say we don't know the answer to that question. And that's one of the questions that in our work we've been exploring, which is that if you could constitute a team from scratch and have anyone you want, it's a bit like, you know, if you want to constitute sort of a fancy football team, the dream football team, right? You know, you can figure out what positions you want and what skills you want and who you want in the team. But with complex challenges, it's not that obvious who you would get. But constituting that team, if you like, that is good at dealing with complexity is the challenge. Yeah? And we can talk about what that might look like as well. My own guesses are in my book, but other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Hi, I love your talk, by the way. Um, so my name's Leslie, and I'm the Dean of Design at California College of the Arts. Um, my question is, um, let's say you have a college that has sort of a calcified set of systems, and you feel that there could be more nimble systems in place, how do you how do you organize 
uh, your thinking to, to shake off that calcification and move forward? And how do you get buy-in from other people? This is, this is a hypothetical question, right? <laughs> Oh, okay, good. good. Yeah, it sounded like Oxford to me, but that's okay. Um, so we had, there's a joke people tell at Oxford, which is how many Oxford dons does it take to change a light bulb? Anyone know the answer? Change? What's that? Um, so, so, I mean, here's one way I would answer your question. So if we think about um, what a lab is, right? Um, so a lab is basically a space. Right? So if you think about a chemistry lab or a physics lab or a biology lab, it's a space where you can kind of, you have certain equipment um, and you have a certain freedom to do a certain type of experiment, if you like, right? You can, you know, do a physics experiment, you can do a chemistry experiment, but it's essentially a space, right, that is amenable to a certain type of activity. So the question is, what kind of spaces are amenable to coming up with responses to complex challenges? Now, any institution, it doesn't matter what, what institution you're talking about, has a culture, has ways of doing things that in some ways um, constrict or constrain the degrees of freedom you have to do things differently, right? So it's kind of like, uh, well, we need to go and hire this person. Well, you can't because our procurement rules mean that we can't do that and we have to do this and we have to do that. It's going to take us two years to get this person in the door. So sorry, we can't do that, right? That's very, very normal for an institution, any organization. So typically the space inside any organization, calcified or not, constrains our ability to respond, our ability to innovate, right? Um, you know, in, in Europe, we now have, like, European rules around health and safety, which mean you can't do most things inside an institution. You can't, you know, you, you know, where people sit, how many people in the room, all of these things are now constrained by Brussels, basically. Ridiculous, right? So what I would say is that what we've got to do is we've got to co-create or create new spaces where we invite people into where those same constraints don't exist. And so what I would say is that um, when we run labs, what we try and do is we try and get two or three different organizations to constitute, if you like, the lab. And what that means is that the culture of any one institution does not dominate that space. It's not your space. It's a co-created, it's, it's a negotiated space, right? So it's like you cannot come into that space and say, well, my procurement rules are what are going to determine what happens in that space. Because like, well, no, there's two other people who own this space. You've got to negotiate with those two other institutional institutions about what the rules are for procurement in this space. So what we're trying to do with labs, if you like, labs in some ways is just code for space. We're trying to create new spaces that are not constrained by your institutional culture and rules and history. And so that's what I would suggest you do, is create a new space and invite people into that space. Do I need to say that again? <laughs> okay, my name's Maria, and I'm a museum exhibit designer and developer, and I teach in the Grad Interaction Design program here. Um, in my work, I we talk a lot about trying to create labs for the museum to do work that is dif difficult for them, because they're extremely ossified institutions, typically. Um, and some of the challenges are that what happens in the lab stays in the lab kind of thing. So I think I'm interested in, you know, just some of my work has been trying to figure out, like, one answer I've had to sort of breaking that conundrum is to do projects that affect the structure of the institution. So if I go to work on a project there, then I want to walk away where they've learned new capacities so that somebody else can do some of whatever I was brought on to do after I'm gone, because otherwise, then I should just stay there, or somebody like me should stay there. So I guess I'm also curious, but that's one solution, I guess, but how do you handle the, okay, after the lab? Right. And maybe that hasn't come up yet for you, but I'm just kind of curious. Well, so, um, I mean, this relates a little bit um, to your question, which is, first of all, if a single institution is owning the lab, then you've got a challenge, basically, inherent. Like, you know, in some ways, the starting conditions are are a problem to a certain extent. So that's one thing. The other thing I'm going to say is that, you know, when we think about a lab again, we think about a, a space. We think about a space that looks like this. We think about physicality, right? And it's like you go into the space, you open the door, and you walk in. So when we, um, 
ran uh, this lab in India, and we took people into the community, and they lived in the community, that was the lab, right? So the bus that they went on, where they sat on the bus and argued for 15 hours before they got to the village, was the lab, right? Um, we didn't call it a lab. It was a bus, right? But that was the lab. So what we did was we created a space, and we put people into that space, and um, things happened in that space. And it was very deliberate, right? So it was like... It was deliberate that we had to travel for 13 hours and not two minutes. Because what we wanted to do was we wanted to create a container for these people to actually engage with each other in a way that was not mediated by us, that wasn't with an agenda on the table. So when we design labs, what we're thinking about is multiple spaces, not a single space. And those multiple spaces have very, very different qualities and characteristics. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to design these hybrid spaces for different types of results to emerge in. Um, but there cannot be one physical space inside an institutional container that is constrained, right? And partly it's because that limits the number of people that can enter that space and experience whatever it is you want to experience. So, you know, um, I remember being in, in Johannesburg, and there's a park in Johannesburg called Juba Park. Um, and you go into this park, and it's full of people, right? So it's packed full of people um, on a weekday. And there's a big, massive white colonial building in the middle of the park, and it's the Johannesburg Art Gallery, right? So I walked in the Johannesburg Art Gallery, and there was not a single person in there. Zero. Nobody there, right? Except the guard at the door, right? And it was like, wow, this is really interesting. There's hundreds of people outside. There's nobody inside, right? So why is it? And it's free to go in. You don't have to pay to go in. Why is there no one inside the art gallery? And, you know, there were, like, Picassos and Impressionists and all sorts of things inside. Amazing art. No one's inside. Any guesses? It's what? No? What else? Other guesses? Why, are, why is there no one inside? Social boundaries? Social boundaries? The, lab the what? The lab, the lab was outside. No, and these people are just hanging out in a park. Right? The, the space was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But also, I mean, it's like I'm not in, allowed to go into this building. It's like this big imperial white formal building, right? And it's like, that's not a place that I can go. No one told me that. There's no rules about it. If you walk in, you'll probably be let in. But it's like, it's these social boundaries, right? It's a space that essentially is not conducive for people to enter for whatever reason, right? So what do you do about that, you know, right? But that's design of space. That's how the space is designed. And you know, in contrast, I remember being in Sao Paulo once, and there's a public library in Sao Paulo. And the way the public library is designed is that the pavement on the street, very busy street outside, curves into the library, right? So as you walk into the walk down this pavement on this very busy street in Sao Paulo, you're suddenly inside a library. You're just like, what just happened here? How did I get into a library? But the road just curves into the library, in contrast, right? Other thoughts, questions? What else is coming up for people? Hi, I'm Noelle. I'm a designer. Um, on the subject of the problems being solved by the people who have skin in the game, um, when you're talking about groups of people that are really under-resourced, I think it's still going to be more common that people with resources are going to be trying to s help them solve their problems just because of the resource allocation. Uh, have you seen any clever ways of, if you are trying to solve problems for an another group of people, how do you make it feel like you've got skin in the game? Or are there, are there ways to sort of arrange? Can you give me like a, a real example of what you're talking about? Give me a real example. Um, OK, well, let's, uh, how about homelessness in San Francisco? I mean, you, it's, it's hard to imagine a group of just homeless people or you know, s some homeless people and some designers you know, working together day to day to come up with a solution. The designers are probably have homes, you know, and they and they can work with the homeless people to get insights and you know have their participation. But the designers don't really have the skin in the game. Yeah. I, I guess I'm just wondering if you have come across any sort of clever workarounds for that to sort of simulate skin in the game. Um, okay, let me put it this way, right? So. If the designers don't have skin in the game, 
the likelihood is that they will drop out at some point, right? Unless there's some contract or some mandate to do the work, right? So typically, you know, we do work because someone pays us to do work or, you know, it's our job or whatever it is, right? But I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, when you're dealing with situations of genuine complexity, let's say homelessness, um, you know, what's more likely that somebody who has experienced homelessness or who has a family member who's experienced homelessness is gonna work on that problem and stick with it than someone who basically sees it as an abstract problem that needs to be solved, right? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So in some ways what I'm saying is what you care about matters, hugely, right? So if you care about homelessness and it's your thing, you're gonna figure it out, right? You're gonna work on that problem and you'll figure it out. But if it's not, then the likelihood is that you know, when the funding runs out or you know, when you get invited to do something more interesting, you go do it. That's normal, we're human beings, right? But what I'm trying to say is that in constituting a team, so going back to your question, right? Who do we get in these teams? So if we're constituting a team of people that are gonna deal with homelessness, who do we get in that team? Who do we, who do we bring in, who do we find, right? We find people that basically have skin in the game, right? You go look then, you go find a designer who's basically like, you know, my dad was homeless for 10 years, I'm gonna do this, right? And I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, you know, I still need to be paid for my work, I still need money and resources and so on, but you know, I'm committed to doing this uh, and we're gonna figure it out. And if we hit a speed bump, I'm gonna figure it out because this is my work, right? So when we get asked by clients, so you know, someone comes to us and says, okay, you know, we wanna work on child malnutrition or we wanna work on, you know, um, you know, equity in a certain area or economic justice or poverty, whatever it is, we have an option for constituting the team. We have an option of going out and hiring you versus you versus you, right? In order to do the work. But what we try and do is constitute people that have some emotional skin in the game. And that's what we're looking for, right? And it's not a judgment or an assessment or a negative or a positive, it's just a fact. It's like, you care about this issue, you wanna work on this issue, that's what we're looking for. And in some cases, we'll go and talk to hundreds of people before we find 30 people or five people or 10 people, right? So there's also tactics for how you find people, right? You broadcast an invitation and you say, okay, we're looking for 35 people to join the A-team for homelessness in San Francisco. Who's in? Who cares about this enough, right? Does that make sense? It sounds like you, as a designer, you should be first introspective about what like which games you have skin in and then go choose what you want to work on? Well, and I would say not just as a designer, but for all of us, right? So it's like, you know, what do I care about? What do I want to work on? What, what, um, uh, what really will fuel me if I work on that, right? Um, so I think it's true for everyone. And I think potentially maybe even more so for designers because you may have a, a, a range more options for what you work on than, you know, someone who's, a, um, I don't know, a software engineer or whatever it is, right? Does that work? Yeah. Let's just go behind you. Yeah. And then we'll come back. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, right there. Oh, sure. <laughs> it's okay. Um, hi, my name is Christine. I'm a, a graduate student in the Interaction Design Program, so I'll have your class tomorrow. Um, I guess my question about dealing with complex problems is how do you even begin breaking down the complexity of the problem and how do you decide where to focus and even start? So for example, homelessness, right? Homelessness has so many other systematic issues behind it. It's not just that somebody has doesn't have a home, but it could be issues of addiction or mental health or um, economic factors that are influencing them. So there's so many other things that influence this complex idea and how do you even begin to like, you know, scale it and start breaking it down to figure out one thing before jumping onto the next. Okay, so um, I'm gonna answer that quickly and hopefully not flippantly because you're gonna be in the class for the next year. Um, so you, you know, you'll get to experience this. But one thing I would say is that um, there are a set of preconditions for action. It doesn't matter what you do, right? If you wanna act on a certain issue, uh, there are a set of preconditions you need to meet. And the preconditions in some ways are really simple. It's like, you know, have you got the right resources? Have you got the right skills? Have you got the right people? Uh, and then do you understand what the challenge is that you're working on is one of the preconditions. Now, this might seem really, really obvious, but believe me, the number of times I've worked with a client who basically says, we want you to help with something. And when you say to them, what is the challenge you want us to work on? What is the problem you want us to address? They don't know. Right? So it's like, what's the challenge you want us to work on? 
okay, we want to reduce the number of homeless pe homeless people in San Francisco to zero. We don't want any homeless people in San Francisco. That's the challenge. Is that what you want to do? That's the challenge, right? In which case, then you start unpacking that challenge rather than reducing it. It's like, well, what are the factors? What are the drivers? What's our best guess as to what's going to work in addressing that? But most of the time, that precondition of actually just being clear on what the question is and what the challenge is is missing. Most of the time. Is that fair, Jeff? I don't know if you would add to that. Jeff and I have been colleagues for a long, long time. So did you want to add anything to that? Uh, just maybe briefly, I, I think this question of care, or um, as I put it to Christian the other day when we were speaking about this, intent, is a kind of um, rudder in the water. Because as you go into such an issue, you're going to be confronted with yourself. Um, so... I would encourage you at the, when, you're, when you're looking in and asking the question, how do you get to know a challenge? How do you know where to start? It's so complex. Um, if you're really going to go into this space and do this work, you, you do have to have that intent and that relentlessness. And then it's a path of discovery. Then it's a gradual clarification of the challenge. It's an unpacking of all of its layers. It's a connecting with real people who have real stories and real experiences. And it's an aha every day that gradually peels the, the onion, gradually reveals something to you about the situation, about human beings, about yourself. You, you start to build relationships with people who have, who have skin in the game, and your skin in the game starts to grow. And then over time, I don't know, Zed, I mean, so much of the analytics become less important. Fade away. And become what becomes more important are the relationships, is the trust that you have and that you create around you with other stakeholders that they feel in the process that you're all going through. And, you know, solutions are, are never worked out on a massive scale. There's, no, there's not massive solutions to social problems. They're micro solutions where people figure out stuff together. And I, I think part of what we're talking about is creating the conditions, the preconditions for that discovery, those relationships, those fields to be built in which those solutions can emerge. And a lot of the data and the kind of crunching and the solutionizing falls behind in favor of figuring out with real people in real space what we can do. Uh, that would be my response. Cool. Yeah. Um, question here and then uh, Rich. Uh, yeah, my name is Rick, and I'm with a philanthropic foundation, Garfield Foundation, who's trying to figure out collaboration and alignment. I'm curious if you can say anything about the learning. You say you want to do experiments and um, you don't know how they're going to turn out. And so I wonder if you can talk about the cycle of learning and then learning from that and then learning from that. Uh, OK, so one of the um, biggest challenges in, this, in terms of responses to complex social challenges is the learning piece. Um, so going back to my analogy of like, you know, if you think about a cancer research facility or a AIDS research facility, the natural sciences have a very mature um, if you like, ecosystem for learning. It's like, you know, if I run an experiment, I'm going to write up my findings, I'm going to publish them so that other scientists can learn from what I've done and tried and either build on it or, or uh, write off that as a dead end that we're not going to pursue, right? So there's a very mature ecology, if you like, of learning in the natural sciences. In the social sciences, it's not true. Or in the so with social sciences, it's not true. Um, and partly because the incentives to do that don't really exist, right? So... When you um, try something out in the social sphere and it fails and you write that up and you publish it, it's a problem because no one wants to fund you then, right? It's like, oh, and that's obviously less true in the Bay Area than other places because, you know, we have a, you know, you're well situated to a uh, culture that's entrepreneurial and experimental and prototyping and so on. But by and large, I would say that, you know, the culture of, um, sharing learning in the social spheres is very, very immature. And I think what we need to do is mature it. So 
you know, I, I can imagine people starting journals up that are open source where people actually publish um, the results. I mean, if you think about all the programs you've probably run over the last decade or two decades or however long it's been, how do I learn from what you have tried? How, do, how does someone in the room basically say, well, you tried something out, it either worked or it didn't work, I need to learn from it, where do I go to do that? It, it's not easy to access that institutional memory and learning. So I think we need to create platforms and publications and spaces to share that learning in a very deliberate way. We have to budget for it, we have to put it into our line items and basically say, you know, we, we are gonna collaborate with 10 foundations in the Bay Area to create a platform to share learning or whatever it is, right? So I just, I just think we have to mature that a lot more than we have because, um, you know, it's a little bit like flying blind. Um, and the analogy I kind of use is it's a bit like, you know, the, you know, the Malaysian plane that got lost, right? It's a bit like we're sending out search planes to find it and those search planes are not talking to each other. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. It'd be like, you know, I've got to tell you that I'm searching this grid area, right? And otherwise, you're gonna try and search the same group. It's just impossible. It's an impossible problem if you don't share those learnings. So, yeah, yeah. So what is reading classroom? What about the projects we've done? Right. How do you build in a culture of learning? Right. I mean, so we've invested quite heavily in it, right? So, you know, if you think about our, our India project, we had, or India Lab, we had a, what we would call a learning historian, so a full-time person inside the lab that was documenting what was going on and publishing it and putting it out there. We had an external person who was working with that internal person to actually um, more objectively look at that material and publish it and put it out there. So we invested, if you like, a large amount of energy and time into doing exactly that. And in some ways, it was kind of that simple. It was like, do it. Yeah? Yeah. Hi, my name is Yairi, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I work at a, an NGO called Young in Prison, and we work on social just, justice issues and educational programs in prisons worldwide, youth prisons. Um, I'd like to respond to a few things said earlier. I'm also triggered by the same question as the lady here um, about what happens after the lab. Um, for example, in our organization, we started created a lab last year. It was a youth lab. We worked with eight uh, ex-youth offenders. And um, what was so difficult is they we asked them to, to get with them to recreate and redesign their own um, period of incarceration. What would be the right uh, punishment in terms of money or in terms of justice or in terms of society? and in terms of re uh, restoration. Um, but we had, what came out was eight individual, um, like you said, micro solutions, uh, social micro solutions. But um, you were saying it's so important to, well, at a certain point, push the market to create funding, uh, to make funding happening. So how to go from these eight micro solutions to, uh, towards market share for your well, little solutions, and yeah. you want to scale up, but how to do that? That's okay. really difficult. We found that really difficult. Yes, okay. So let me just say a couple of things. So one is, um, uh, again, coming back to what happens after the lab, right? So if you, if I go back to, sorry, the analogy I keep using, you know, the pleasant analogy of cancer um, and a cancer research lab. So if you have a lab in society that is creating value, why will it end, right? If you've got a problem and the problem hasn't been solved, right? Why are you going home? What are you doing? What are you thinking? That actually the problem solved, I can go home now? You know, you can't go home. You've got to keep working on it, right? Until it's resolved. So one thing I would just say is that the best way of thinking about a lab or any intervention in a complex space is that you need stability. You need enough time and stability to figure out what works and doesn't work and then to try the next thing out. And if you don't have that stability, the likelihood of coming up with a response as a one-off the first time you try and come up with a response and that response is right is extremely low, right? So, so that's the first thing. You need a stable platform. You need to have stability to figure out what works and doesn't work. The other thing I would just say is that, and I'm gonna kind of compliment um, a little bit what um, Jeff said and, um, and try and cl clarify from my point of view how you respond to the micro situation, which is that I don't believe scaling as a strategy works, almost never. So my suggestion is forget about scaling, right? 
Most scaling strategies don't work, I would say, first of all. So what do you do instead of scaling is you operate at scale. So what is the scale that you want to address the problem at? Okay, so is the problem you want to address or the challenge you want to address homelessness in, in the Bay Area or is it homelessness in San Francisco or is it homelessness in one district and one part of the city? And any one of those is okay, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, the scale I'm going to operate at, it's going to be pan-galactic and it's going to encompass everything, right? Forget it. Doesn't make sense, right? Um, you can if you want to do that. It's just harder work, right? It's like I want to win the World Cup versus I want to play Little League. It's fine. You want to win the World Cup, good. It's going to take you 10 years and 20 years and 15 years of practice to get there. If you're up for it, go for it. So what I would say is that you've got to make a decision as to the scale of the challenge you want to impact, and then you've got to work at that scale rather than come up with pilot solutions that are, in theory, going to scale up, which almost never happens, right? And what it means to operate at scale isn't to operate at a policy, a, at a disembodied policy level. It means that you have to design responses that will work at the scale that you want to see a response, right? So for example, let's say you're talking about prisons and you say, okay, we're looking for a response that's national. So what that means is that you've got to design something that will work for the number of prisoners that you have in the Netherlands. It's a design constraint, right? You can't spend 100,000 euros per prisoner because if you multiply that by all the prisoners you have, it makes no sense. There's no way you can pay for it. So your design constraint becomes, well, the amount of money we can likely spend per prisoner is 10 euros or 5 euros or 40 euros, and that's the design constraint. So we're going to design solutions that are human scale, to go back to what Jeff said, but that can grow, right? So if you do it for 10 prisons in the Netherlands and it's a solution that's working, you bet someone's going to copy that. You're going to have growth as opposed to scaling. So I would say design for growth, not for scaling. Forget about scaling as a strategy. It doesn't work. And operate at the scale that you want to see a response at. Hey, Said, I think there's a really crucial thing to recognize about this particular example or that we can extract from this particular example. So when, when there are micro solutions, eight micro solutions, what you can realize is that, OK, um, what if there were 80 micro solutions or 800 or 8,000 micro solutions, right? That constitutes a real paradigm shift. So what you'll find is when you want to scale and you try to get a system, a prison system or a, uh, uh, any kind of system that exists now to adopt the new and scale, it won't work because the system's not designed to do that. So growth means you could have 800 or 8,000 or 80,000 micro solutions, but it's a paradigm shift. And you have to be prepared to usher that in and define it and invest in that. Cool. Any last questions? And we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to Christian to close. Anything else that's coming up? Yeah. One here. And anyone else? Yeah. Um, hi. Can you talk um, a little bit about experiments and how they, they relate to that idea of operating at growth at the um, um, with the responses at the level that you want to hit? Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of goes back, it goes back to a little bit what I just said a, a, a minute ago, which is that um, scale is a design constraint, right? So it's like, you know, um, you want to design a response for um, homelessness across the entire country is a design constraint, right? And if you want to do that, then any solution that you come up with has to be able to, has to, be, able to be rolled out, at a, right, for the amount of money and resources that exist nationally to do that. So if you design a solution for homelessness, which is, hey, let's just buy every homeless person a house, uh, it's not going to work because obviously there's no resources to do that. So what's the design? So the design constraint becomes comes from the scale that you decide to operate at. So if you decide to operate in one district in San Francisco, and you think, OK, well, how many homeless people are there? 5,000. You've got to design for 5,000 people, basically. And you can come up with solutions. You can prototype and test solutions that you can imagine would be rolled out for 5,000 people, as opposed to 500,000 people, or a million people, or 2 million people. Whole different ball game, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? yeah? OK. Okay, cool. So I'll hand over to Christian. Thank you very much, and good to talk to you. I've, my role here is really just to congratulate Zaid, and um, I had a few insights tonight. 
because there's a couple of things I've been really impressed by, I'll include Jeff and Zaid's work through Rio's partners and what they're doing now. One is just the tenacity they have for convening. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm probably going to get the example wrong, but something like the Columbia workshop where you were bringing, you know, both political parties, you were bringing, like, the drug power that was in the space and FARC and business leadership and, you know, trying to bring them together for real change and to evolve Colombia into something that was more functional. And I believe it took two or three years to bring these parties together. Is that... That, you know, and I was just amazed by the tenacity. Like, I run a lot of workshops, and, you know, if it takes two or three weeks to get everyone in the room and to think, like, what it would be like to try and uh, work for two years to convene a workshop, you know. We have some that have been going for about five years, and we still haven't managed to get everyone in the room. Five years. And part of that is the tenacity to make sure that the right people are in the room. Like, we can't do this unless all power is represented. We can't do this unless the vertical integration is represented. You know, so, like, I remember I asked you, like, how do you get these people? Like, well, you find someone. Like, you're, it's just uh, Zaid and uh, Jeff and the way they work is radically pragmatic. It's like, well, somebody must know somebody who knows someone in the Clinton Foundation, and Bill Clinton knows everyone. So if you can find that person, talk to that person, give an introduction, then Bill Clinton will introduce you to the head of that person. And that might take a couple of years, but eventually you're going to get that intro that's going to say, we're doing this thing, and we're going to convene this workshop. And sort of as a designer who's convened hundreds of workshops, I was just kind of blown away at like that, because I'm usually... Usually my, one of my limits is time and money, and um, it runs out long before two years. The other one is there's fantastic case studies. Like if you just go Google Rio's Partners case studies, I think they've done a fantastic job of documenting their work. So um, I, and it's really nice to hear you're saying like, you've got to invest in that from the start. Um, third thing is there are books in the back. Um, I, want, I want to encourage you, and you know what, what how much they cost? 20 bucks. Best 20 bucks you'll ever spend. 20 bucks tonight. Eric has got a few books back there. As I, I've already read mine like five times, and it's, uh, it's great. <laughs> um, that's it. So I really uh, am excited that we have a partnership with Zaid. I'm really excited that you agreed to do this talk tonight and invite all, all these folks here to CCA. So um, please, uh, another round of applause for Zaid.